And without further ado, I'm so excited to welcome our speakers here from RBC Wealth Management. We have Catherine Chen, Cindy Randau, and Kimberly Shapi. Ladies, welcome. Thank you for being with us here today. So today we wanted to focus on understanding your money mindset and how that interacts with various parts of your life. So Kim, Catherine, and I are each going to share our personal money mindset and how that's impacted a piece of our lives or how we see that impacting other people as well. And so one of the things that we wanted to also point out is it's the reason we're having this conversation is really comes down to being able to own your story so that it doesn't own you. And when we think about the different money mindsets, this comes from financial psychologist, Dr. Brad Klonk. And we developed one of four main money scripts or money personalities that drive financial behavior throughout our lives. And we typically will gravitate toward one of them, but it doesn't mean that we don't identify with parts of any or of all of them for that matter. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start with my money script and then I will turn it over to Catherine and then to Kim and wrap it up. For myself personally, I was born into welfare. My mom had four children to raise by herself. My dad walked out literally the day I was born. And so we didn't have money. My mom barely had a job and we really relied on charity from others, including going to the food bank or the food shelf, receiving monies from the church, assistance from the community, et cetera. And for myself, that has really come into money vigilance. I never want to be in that position ever again. And I never want to drink powdered milk ever again, nor will I even bake with powdered milk because it is god awful. So it's what it's done to me is I recognize when I go to a restaurant, I'm looking at what costs the least amount, not what I feel like eating. And it's because I've always had to rely on how much money is in the checking account to know if I can afford to eat. That's how I grew up. And so, especially with the pandemic, I started to refocus my charitable giving because I'm now in a place where I can share and give back to others, just like others helped me when I was young, I can do that for others now too. And so I spent a lot of time focusing on what's really important to me. And for anyone who knows me, they know I love my dogs. And so that gets a piece of my charitable money are any type of rescue organization, but especially small dog rescues. And then also I realized I wanted to give back to the food banks, especially during the pandemic, we saw so many people who weren't able to put food on the table for their families. People were dealing with an insecurity around food and I wanted to be able to give back to that. And thankfully at RBC, we have a matching gift program where I was able to double my gift to the food bank because my employer was kind enough to match my gift. And that has become something that really helped me feel that I've made it. And I don't have to focus as much on, you know, the price when I go out to eat, but, you know, being able to give back to others who maybe aren't as fortunate as I am today. So that's my story. And I appreciate all of you listening. And with that, I'm gonna share um, my colleague, Catherine Chen, I'm going to give her the floor so that she can share her story. Thank you so much, Cindy. And um, that was an amazing story. Um, hello, everyone there. Um, I'm Catherine Chen. I'm a financial advisor. 
at RBC Wealth Management. I focus on sustainable investment in, in San Francisco. And uh, in looking at the four categories, which we have posted up here, my money script follows that of money vigilance as well. And this money script, of course, stresses saving money and knowing the value of money, a focus on frugality, as you can see from the writing. However, over time, my relationship with money has shifted from being focused just on the value of money to one where money and values come together for a greater purpose. So before getting too much into the transition, why don't I start with my early years as a, a young girl growing up in California. I was blessed to grow up in a household that I didn't really feel I uh, wanted for anything. My parents were amazing, uh, provided, you know, food every day, you know, great food on the table and sent me to college. I'm so grateful for the security of growing up in a, a nice house in an upper middle class community. However, my family always instilled in me a sense of frugality and somewhat a sin of wasting money. I, I remember early years, my mom always combing the papers, clipping coupons or my dad <laughs> looking for the best deals at restaurants we shopped the clearance racks because it was where you could find the best deals and you it was the right thing to do. So early on, my relationship with money was always that it was a scarce resource and not to be spent on frivolous items. You had to know the value of money. And I grew up thinking it wasn't right to think about buying flashy trappings. It was wasteful and we had to think about the saving element of money. And so I grew up respecting the value of money and coming it at it from an angle of saving. But as I grew up and as I entered the workforce, my focus turned to how money was not just something where you had to save and it was a means to spend, but rather that money, if applied in the right manner, could be incredibly powerful to advance values. And let me tell you what I mean by that a little bit more. So uh, my career as a uh, financial advisor is, is more than just a job. I have the privilege to advise clients every day on sustainable investment. And what that means in a nutshell is that I see the capital markets as a tool and lever to make long-term social environmental change. So money can be used to advance your values and there is power in money to make positive impact. So let me give you a little bit more context on that. So we all vote with our values. We pick candidates who best express our hopes and aspirations. We buy items with our values. We buy clothes or goods that represent how we wish to be seen. How many of you have a college alma mater t-shirt or bought a car that reflects your personality? Those are reflections of values. Now, from a business practice, I see money as the economic representation of values. Money is not just to be saved, but invested to achieve greater long-term impact. In my team, we steer environmentally focused clients and do, for example, climate change initiatives. We have investments that focus on gender equity, obviously something, something very important for today's conference. We have investments that look at community investing and advancing areas that have had limited access to financing. So while money is being invested, it is helping to speed up social and environmental change. And while political gridlock can be can stymie change, we see investments can actually help advance change more quickly. So through money and investments, we're able to advance our clients' values bring about long-term positive impact and align our clients' own money script with their own values. So, um, so anyways, just in closing, as I reflect on my own emotional relationship with money, clearly it's changed over the years and transitioned. Um, and uh, it's, you know, started off obviously being in the category of money vigilance uh, to today seeing the power of money to advance values and make great impact. But that being said, you know, I still see roots of my my parents, you know, as, as I talk to my own kids and my my kids telling me to re remind me to bring the coupons or going straight to the clearance racks themselves. 
And it, it's funny how I see my, my own kids repeating the same messages that my parents taught me as a, a young girl. So I guess you can take uh, the girl out of the money script, but you can't take the money script out of the girl. So anyways, thanks for listening. And I am going to kick it off to my colleague, Kimberly, to uh, speak next. Uh, I love hearing both of your stories so much. And thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to just zoom out a little bit. So. I love working with women and money and helping women feel stronger about their relationship with money. And what I see here is that women are the key to solving all the problems in the world once we claim our financial power. And by that, I mean, when you look at how women spend money, it's typically different than how men spend money. And I'm just going to throw this out to the chat, but do you know what the first thing women spend money is on? Their first thing is always family. And the second thing is always community. And that's a really different order of operations, food, children. Yes, yes, love it, attendees. So that is like so a different order of operations than when we look at what men traditionally spend money on. And I'm not here to bash on men, but I want to focus on if we change women's relationship with money so that instead of feeling fear or scarcity or even hesitation, and we turn that to a relationship of power, the whole world's going to change. Climate change is going to get better. There's going to be fewer wars. We're going to solve a lot of the big problems happening. And so, like, I just feel so much personal excitement around helping women feel better about their relationship with money. And so when I work with our clients and when we get to work with our clients, what we often see is that the reason someone is having a hard time achieving financial success isn't because they aren't mentally capable of figuring out compounding of the time value of money. It almost always comes down to their psychology. It comes down to like these deep invisible scripts around money. And so what we like to do is what my colleagues have just touched on is like slow down and reflect on what are the stories that you have always told yourself around money and are they true? And I loved, oh my gosh, Cindy's story about like the menu and looking at the prices made me really think about like what got you to where you are today? Is it going to get you to the next level of where you want to get to? And that's why we have jobs and careers is because so many people realize that you are the company you keep. Like what voices are talking to you about money? Um, so what I see sometimes in working with people is the person who lived through a depression and who grew up with multiple like years on years of scarcity is never gonna feel comfortable not having cash on hand the way someone who was raised in the 80s and 90s and has seen like pretty consistent success and doesn't really know what it's like to have long-term financial challenges. Or I have an Australian client, Australia hasn't experienced a recession in 30 years. They don't know what a recession's like. You know, so like your money mindset can be so different and it shapes everything. And what we really wanna do is encourage you to reflect on what story are you telling yourself about money and is it helping you get to the next level? So when I look at my money story, I grew up with small business owners sitting around the table at dinner talking about why the till was short, did somebody steal, how are they gonna make the next month's payroll and how important that was to them. And what I saw with my parents and what I saw with Enron, and many of us probably lived through that situation, is you always have to know where the money goes. No one else, if you're the small business owner, if you're the large business owner, if you're in charge, I call it the CHO, the chief household officer. If you're maybe not a CFO in every day, but you're running your family's finances, no one else is going to watch that money like you do because it's your money. And then maybe me and Catherine and Cindy too. But so when you're doing that and you're looking at your money, you've got to go back to like, what are the stories I've always told myself about money and do they make sense? And Cindy, can I say one more thing? Do I have time for one more thing? Cindy and I did this exercise. Okay, thanks. Cindy and I did this exercise at a conference called the Athena Conference. And one of the attendees came up to me afterwards and she told me the story that I just think is too good to not share. And she said, Tim, my husband and I bought a new home. It's our dream home. And we're really proud of it. And we're really excited about it. And I had my family over and some friends to see our new home. And when they came over, I told them that the only reason we could afford the home was because there was asbestos, asbestos in the attic and that nobody else wanted to buy it for that reason. And she said that when her friends left, her husband said to her like, hey, it's kind of weird that you tell everybody the only reason we could afford the home was because of the asbestos. Um, that's not really true. And yeah, the asbestos was there, but we liked it for all these other reasons. And I thought you loved the home. And she said that then she realized she grew up in a house where her parents did not like people who had money. Her parents had this like very invisible story around greed and how money was something we didn't talk about. And our values were around other things, but like money isn't something we're proud of. And it's not something that we think does good in the world. 
And so this woman had like had this deep shame around her ability to buy her dream home. Like I almost cried when she told me that story. And so when we work with people, I know all of us are super focused on how do we change it so that it's not greedy to talk about money. It's not icky to talk about money, you know, the pay gap. We're never going to close the pay gap unless women start talking about how much they make and how they manage their money. Investment gap, same thing. You've got to like talk about the money to fix this problem. We can't all do it in the dark. Okay, Cindy, you're the moderator. I'm going to stop. That's a little bit about my money story. <laughs> no, that's that's great, Kim. And you're absolutely right. Until we start lifting each other up and talking about where we come from with our money, it's not going to get better because women in general don't feel as confident. They typically, even if they take the same quiz as a man and score better, they still will say that they they don't know as much about money. Whereas man's going to be like, oh yeah, I absolutely know everything about money. So one of the things that I've really enjoyed with working with both of you is the knowing that I have strong female colleagues to help lift up. And when we talk about our money scripts, it's things we don't talk about very often. And I spend my entire day talking to clients about death and taxes, which so much fun, I know, right? But hearing everybody's stories and kind of seeing what the differences between women and men. And I've started to use more of this money script conversation with the clients so that they can hear each other and where they came from. Even though they already know the story probably of where their spouse came from, it doesn't necessarily mean that they've had the aha moment yet of, huh, that's where my spouse came from because when I look at my husband and I, we have very different upbringing. He came from, you could always spend money on whatever you want. And I obviously didn't. And so for the two of us, it took some time to really navigate that minefield. And I'm sure the two of you can appreciate that as well as you've talked with clients and in your own personal situations. So what I want to make sure everyone on this call takes away from this is owning your own money script. It doesn't mean you can't change it, but know where it came from because it, it came from somewhere. And understand what the people in your life, what their money scripts are, because that will sometimes impact how you interact with them, whether subconsciously or consciously. So with that, I'm just going to take a a little bit of time, give you both the floor once again for some of your final thoughts. So Catherine, do you have any final thoughts that you wanna share with women? I, you know, I think um, you, you've pretty much said it all. I think, um, you know, knowing yourself and, 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 and trying to um, navigate that can be a little tough, right? And so I think, don't be afraid to reach out. There's lots of resources. Today's um, event is is unleashing a lot of power and connections and networking. And we're all here to be supportive, to help you navigate that, uh, you know, you know, a path and figuring out that money script and figuring out um, how uh, money plays into your, your role. So don't be afraid to reach out because we're all here and we all want everyone to succeed. Of course. I think and Kim, I know you've Thanks. got more to share with us. I just can't help myself. I think, like for me, if everybody, like you're not just doing this for yourself, you're doing it for every woman next to you, beside you, and that's going to come after you. And so this problem is something, and when I say problem, the pay gap, so women making less than men typically, and then the investment gap, so women being caretakers for such a long time over their lifetime that their investment earnings aren't nearly as high as men's and they have to like dip out of the workforce and dip back in. All that is so real. And the only way we're gonna solve those things is if each of us individually starts to have this like very quiet, integrated whole self approach to financial management in our lives. And then if we could also shine that light 
on the other women in our lives, just like subtly and kindly, and even like asking your closest girlfriend what their money story is and how they approach their financial management, I think can be so helpful and powerful. And it's like this little muscle, right? And remember, perfect is the enemy of good. So like just scrap perfect, but this little muscle that you just start flexing and trying a little bit time and time again. I'm also gonna go to Maya Angelou and that line that I just love so much. And I'm gonna say slowly, cause I think you gotta sit with it, but your crown has been bought and paid for. All you have to do is put it on. And I, I like hear her saying that to me in a poetic voice of like, little girl, all you gotta do is put that crown on. You know, like our ancestors, like all these women that came before us who have been fighting so hard so we can work and we can earn money and we can see our husband's tax returns. Did you guys know? I think Cindy could correct me. That was like 1960s, 1970s. We couldn't even see what our spouse filed on a tax return because maybe we didn't deserve to know the household income. Anyway, we just stand on the shoulder of these beautiful giants. And I just think like it's up to all of us to own, like how can we make some shifts that are gonna change the whole landscape for everyone? Okay, Cindy, back to you. All right, so one last thing. The women in general, part of every woman's money script is women don't handle money well. It is absolutely false. It is beyond false. And in my, in my work, working with clients and talking about their kids, it's always the son who can't handle money. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say it's always, but women are smarter, funnier, nicer, just the most wonderful people in the world. And you are smart enough, you are good enough, and gosh darn it, you deserve everything. So don't feel like I don't, I don't know how to handle money because you do. You do just as well as the man sitting next to you and possibly even more because you've doubted yourself for so long. And to Kim's point about us lifting each other up, tell your friends, your sisters, your cousins, every woman in your life that they are good enough, that they understand money, that this is not something to be fearful of because that has been a part of our gender's money script for far too long. I appreciate everybody taking time to listen. And if you get a chance, um, spend some time really thinking about your money script and where it came from. Think about how your parents raised you and really how did your mom treat money? What was your mom's relationship with money? Because that has a huge impact on us as women in turn, because I was only raised by my mom. So that's all I had to show me. But I know women in general will look to how did their mom treat money? So definitely spend some time on that and just know you're good and you've got this. Ladies, Thank that you. was super enlightening, super thought provoking, it really made me think. And um, I love this idea. I, I love and equally dread this idea of making sure to talk to my girlfriends about our money mindset, because it is really, um, it's really different from what I'm comfortable with or what I'm used to. And it's so true. We, we, we sweep it under the rug and we don't acknowledge it. So thank you for showing us the way and helping us think differently about something that's really important to all of us and all of our families and to women everywhere. Thank you.